Hello. Right, this week we're going to talk about the anatomy of the hiatus hernia. You'll also see it called hiatal hernia, but when I'm working, surgeons tell me off if I call it hiatus. If I call it hiatal hernia, they tell me off. They tell me I should say hiatus hernia. It's like appendicectomy. It gets called an appendectomy. They, tell, they say, I should say appendicectomy. Anyway, you get the gist. All right, so the hiatus hernia, there are a number of hernias and we're talking about abdominal contents getting out of the abdominal cavity. This is one of the ways that this that the abdominal contents can do this and it's through the diaphragm. So I want to talk about the anatomy of, well, that bit of the diaphragm, of the esophagus, of the stomach, the lower esophageal sphincter, how the diaphragm forms a bit of an external sphincter, pressure differences, oh, there's loads of anatomy. Uh, place your bets now, is this gonna be a brief? We don't need to place your bets as to whether this is gonna be brief or not because you've already seen how long it's gonna be, I've no idea. All right then, oh, we didn't get a good squeal going, that's a shame. Um, straight into the anatomy. So we're talking about abdominal contents leaving the abdominal cavity. Um, it's surrounded by a wall of muscle essentially, holding it all in. How might it escape? Well, in this case, with a hiatus hernia, we're talking about a hiatus, we're talking about a gap a gap in the diaphragm. So take out the liver, take off the greater omentum. Here's the stomach, now look. The stomach, esophagus, diaphragm, esophagus, thorax and abdomen. So the esophagus is passing between the thorax and the abdomen. There's a potential weakness here. Consider the pressure differences. As you breathe in and out, the pressure inside the thorax changes, but the pressure is largely negative. That's what draws air in. You create a negative pressure inside the thorax, inside the lungs, air is drawn in to equalize the pressure with the outside. So the pressure in here is low. Consider the pressure in the abdomen. If you squeeze your abdominal muscles, you can, you can hear and feel the air being pushed out of the thorax. So the pressure in the abdomen is high. The pressure in the thorax is low. It's an idea, isn't it? So if the esophagus passing between the thorax and the abdomen is a potential hole, weakness, gap, by which high pressure stuff here can get pushed into a low pressure area, that's what we're talking about. This is a hiatus hernia when exactly that happens. So what gets pushed into the thorax then? Can you see how the esophagus joins the stomach? I mean, this is just a model, but you get the gist. You see how the diaphragm is curved. Very important to always remember that the diaphragm is a dome shape that flattens when we inhale and forms a dome again when we relax, when we breathe out, which means that all of this is moving. Uh, and in a hiatus hernia, the, the esophagus, which is normally held physically in position in relation to the diaphragm, we'll talk about that in a moment, the esophagus will push into the thorax and the stomach will push into the thorax. And it can do that in a couple of different ways, so we have a few different types. Now we need to talk about sphincters, as I said, because we're, talk we're thinking about different pressures. And we've got to think about the pressure in the stomach, in the esophagus, swallowing, that sort of thing. All right, the sphincter mechanism here is really interesting. When you belch, you kind of micromanage it, right? When you let gas out of the stomach to pass back up the esophagus, you are manipulating these sphincters or this sphincter. Okay, there is an intrinsic sphincter within the esophagus. That's what intrinsic means, it's part of the esophagus. So in the gastrointestinal tract, we have layers of muscle, the longitudinal muscle, and we have circular muscle. And this means that the gastrointestinal tract can shorten and can squeeze contents along its inside tube. Now, where the esophagus passes through the diaphragm and meets the stomach, the circular layer of muscle is thickened into a fairly decent sphincter, and this is the lower esophageal sphincter. So you can close that off 
between, to, to close off the esophagus to the stomach, except you can't think to close that off. That's controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. It's under involuntary control. It's smooth muscle because it's the circular muscle of the gut. So that's the lower esophageal sphincter. And there are some cool sling arrangements and that sort of thing with where it meets the stomach. So that's the intrinsic sphincter, which means if there's a high pressure in the stomach, it'll stay inside the stomach unless that sphincter opens and allows that pressure out through the esophagus. Now, the diaphragm is also having an effect on keeping the esophagus closed here. There's a surprising amount to the diaphragm, but posteriorly it has a couple of legs. A leg is a crus, so crura. A couple of legs anchoring the diaphragm posteriorly to the posterior parts of the abdominal wall. If I take the stomach off, you can see how beautifully reproduced the directions of these muscle fibers are here, surrounding the, the esophagus. You can see the crus there, surrounding the esophagus in that scissor type arrangement. So you can probably have an idea there of how, if the diaphragm contracts, those muscle fibers are gonna help squeeze the esophagus. That is the extrinsic sphincter. And the diaphragm is striated muscle, skeletal muscle. It's under voluntary control. You can choose to control your diaphragm. Um, most of the time you don't have to because you have automatic centers inside your brain doing it for you. But you can move the diaphragm if you want to. So here we have an extrinsic sphincter and an intrinsic sphincter. And the fascia, seagulls are really going for it, the fascia of the diaphragm blends, links, ties into strongly, physically, the layers of the esophagus, anchoring the esophagus to the diaphragm. This is the phrenoesophageal ligament. Now, you know how I feel about the word ligament and it getting used for things that don't actually attach bones to bones. So this does also get called the phrenoesophageal membrane. It's the fascia, the connected tissue sheet covering the diaphragm, blending, diving into the esophagus to anchor it. So this anatomy seems like a good idea for a couple of reasons. One, <gasps> <coughs> shouldn't cough these days, it frightens people. But if you take a <gasps> rapid inhalation, a rapid deep breath, the diaphragm is gonna rapidly contract squeeze the esophagus and close off that potential weakness, that potential gap between the abdomen and the thorax is gonna close off that hiatus. Really, really useful when you cough and sneeze, which tend to be rapid inhalations and rapid exhalations. So the diaphragm is, it's doing something useful here and helping, right, helping manage the pressure between those two spaces. Number two, that phrenoesophageal membrane is keeping the esophagus, uh, the, that, that sphincter we talked about, that lower esophageal sphincter is a few centimeters long. And look at the angle here that it's running through. It can take a couple of centimeters to kind of pass through the diaphragm, even though the diaphragm is a fairly thin for a muscle layer. But the phrenoesophageal membrane is keeping the esophagus anchored to the diaphragm. So as the diaphragm moves, these things move with it. But, this being a connective tissue, you may well be aware of what happens to connective tissues as we get older and what happens to the fibroblasts maintaining those connective tissues. Short answer, they don't do as good a job. We see that in our skin as we age as the most visible form, but it's happening throughout our bodies. Our connective tissues are not as strong, are not as taut, are not as well maintained when we're older as when we were younger. So the number one risk factor for developing a hiatal hernia or a hiatus hernia is age. And I've seen published data that suggests that when you're over 50 or in the population over 50 years old, more than half of that group of people have a hiatus hernia. The vast majority have no symptoms. So what is a hiatus hernia then? Well, we've talked about that bit, but there are, I said there are, there are two main types and then there's kind of a third and fourth type as we get a bit more extreme. But the, the type one hiatus hernia 
is known as a sliding hiatus hernia. And anatomically, this makes a lot of sense. The esophagus slides up through the hiatus in the diaphragm into the abdomen and the stomach follows it. So the stomach passes through the hiatus in the diaphragm. That's a sliding hiatus hernia because we're no longer well anchored. The esophagus is no longer well anchored to the diaphragm, so this can slide up and down. All right. The type two hiatus hernia is the paraesophageal hiatus hernia. Paraesophageal, esophageal, esophagus, para besides. So that is when the, the hiatus, when the, that hole in the diaphragm that the esophagus passes through um, is wider and the stomach can pass up into the thorax next to the esophagus. Do you see what I mean? So in the type 1, the esophagus passes up into the thorax and the stomach follows. In the type 2 hiatus hernia, the esophagus is in its usual position and the stomach pushes up into the thorax alongside it. So we have esophagus and stomach passing through the diaphragm next to each other into the thorax. That's the type 2. That type 2 or paraesophageal hiatus hernia sometimes also gets called a rolling hiatus hernia. Rolling being different to sliding. I know. It. Type 3 and 4 essentially describe a broadening of that hole and more and more uh, abdominal contents pass into the thorax. Um, in that stage, it tends to be a bad thing because, you know, it's helpful to have space in your thorax with the things that like to be in your thorax. And if that space is taken up by things from your abdomen, you tend to get signs and symptoms that mimic many chest conditions. So what are those signs and symptoms then? Well, maybe you can work them out. As I said, in most people, there are no symptoms or minor symptoms. Uh, but the most common symptom is the development of gastroesophageal reflux disease or GORD. Um, because, well, this is, the symptom is heartburn. <clears throat> so you feel chest pain, you feel heartburn because acid from the stomach is passing into the esophagus. The esophagus is not, is not evolved to cope very well with that acid, so it causes pain. Um, <clears throat> and there are a number of putative mechanisms by which this occurs, but that lower esophageal sphincter is not working as well as it did. So heartburn, acid reflux, um, and the development of gastroesophageal reflux disease are the most common results of um, a hiatal hernia or a hiatus hernia. Beyond that, as these things start pushing into the, the thorax, then you can imagine shortness of breath because the lungs don't have the space they used to have, um, palpitations of the heart, in fact because the vagus nerve is probably irritated rather than anything else, difficulty swallowing because the whole esophagus is involved in that swallowing motion, so dysphagia, but those signs and symptoms are rare. All right, so what do you do to treat this then? Well, most of the time you treat the symptoms, not the cause. So um, acid reflux can be treated in a number of different ways. Heartburn, you know, managing the acid and that sort of thing. So if you can manage the heartburn, great. But if this defect becomes worse and larger and starts to develop complications, then it can be repaired surgically. Uh, and that's about it. You know, in most people, as I said, there are no signs or symptoms. Um, so this can be caused by <laughs> lifting heavy things because of course you're, you're, you're increasing the pressure inside your abdomen. It can be caused by um, prolonged bouts of vomiting, coughing, you know if you have an upper, if you have a respiratory tract condition and you cough heavily for a prolonged period of time that can cause weaknesses in the abdominal wall to, to fail and likewise can lead to a hiatus hernia. So think about that sort of thing. If somebody's had you know, something like that. They've lifted something heavy and then they have the signs of a hiatus hernia or if they've had a long bout of coughing or vomiting illness and so on, all right? Link all these things together. This is why function is so useful and important. And that's why I went into the detail about the sphincters down here, not just because the anatomy is really cool. It's, you often don't think about it, but it's really important 
again, another bit of our body that we take for granted. But when you understand this anatomy, you can link all the other bits together, better understand what's going on, better fix it. Anyway, there we go, that's it. Um, the anatomy of a hiatus hernia. See you next week.